Good evening. Welcome tonight to tonight's Forest History Association of Wisconsin webinar. Uh, we have the good fortune of having a webinar on When the White Pine Was King, a history of lumberjacks, log drives, and sawdust cities in Wisconsin. Um, for more than a half a century, logging in Wisconsin Northwoods provided jobs for tens of thousands of Wisconsinites and impacted the lives of nearly every Wisconsin citizen. When the White Pine was king transports readers back to the lumber boom era and reveals how the lessons learned in the vast northern forest lands continue to shape the region today. Here you'll find the colorful stories of the heyday of logging, stories of lumberjacks and camp life, uh, the cooks, the sawmills, the boom towns, boom towns, river drives, and deadly log jams. Jerry Apps, the author, uh, explores the aftermath of the logging area, including efforts to take the farm from the cutover, and most of these were doomed to fail, to successful reforestation work, and the legacy the lumber and wood products industry leaves in the state. Our author, Jerry Apps, has written more than 50 nonfiction books, and or non 50, 50 nonfiction and fiction books many of them on rural Wisconsin life and country life. His nonfiction titles include the Civilian Conserver Conservation Corps in Wisconsin, Nature's Army at Work, The Land Still Lives, Barns of Wisconsin, The Wisconsin Agriculture, A History. He was born and raised in central Wisconsin or on a central Wisconsin farm. He's a former county extension agent and a professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Madison, where he taught for 30 years. Today, he works as a rural historian, a full-time writer, and he has created five documentaries uh, with PBS and won regional Emmy Awards for his farm winter. He and his wife, Ruth, divide their time between their home in Madison and their farm, Rochera, in Washera County. So tonight I'm going to turn this over to Jerry and uh, welcome him on behalf of the Forest History Association. I know he's got good things to share with us tonight. Jerry, it's yours. Thank you, uh, thank you so very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share a few things about uh, Wisconsin's uh, uh, forest history, which is a fascinating part of our history. Uh, this is the cover of the book and I will talk more about these log drivers in a little bit. So uh, next, uh, a little bit of background before I get into uh, talking about forest history. This is the home farm where I grew up, uh, four and a half miles west of Wild Rose uh, in Washera County. And just to the uh, north of our farmhouse was about 20 acres of, uh, of, of woods. Mostly uh, oak, uh, black oak and, and white oak. And so my introduction uh, to forestry uh, was going out into that woods uh, every fall and, and cutting firewood because we heated uh, this old house uh, with wood stoves. And by the way, I was born uh, in this house and I spent a lot of time in this old barn uh, as a farm kid, oldest in the, in the family. My grandfather, uh, Epps, uh, was a, a chef who had come to this country after the Civil War. And he uh, was a cook in logging camps in Northern Wisconsin. He also was a farmer in the summertime, but in the winter he and, and my uncle uh, Fred went north and my uncle Fred worked as a lumberjack and my grandfather was a cook. In 1947, I joined a 4-H club that we had organized in our community. And one of the projects that I took was forestry because for whatever reason, I was always interested in trees. And in fact, I never got over it. And one of the projects that we had, one of the activities that we had was to, we received little seedlings, only two or three inches tall. Uh, we got them free. Uh, I've got a hundred of them. And my task as a 4-H member was to grow these out for three years and then transplant them. 
which is what I did. And back of the chicken house is where I had this little nursery uh, for, my, uh, for my little trees. And I planted all these trees as part of my 4-H project. And now, all these years later, I drove by where I had planted the trees the other day. And there I saw them now 60 some feet tall and taller. And I remembered, I remembered planting them. I remembered when they were two inches tall. Forestry was something that was always of great interest to me. During World War II, uh, we had a uh, sawmill right in Melrose, E.L. Kanoki had a sawmill. And during World War II, he mostly sawed ties, railroad ties of oak uh, for, the, for the military, for, for the army. And, and I thought that was kind of interesting to watch how this sawmill, how this sawmill worked. So in the uh, next uh, slide, Chris, please. I then in 1966, next slide, Chris. We've been practicing this and it has its little, its little difficulties. One moment, Jerry, I might have to reshare. Okay. What I, um, what I will be talking about is the farm uh, that, we, uh, that my wife and I bought in 1966. And it was a broken down old sandy farm, hilly and sandy and stony and about two miles from where I grew up. And can you back up? I'll yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Okay, now I'll just go to the next one. This is... Um, this is one of the uh, plantations I have uh, on, our, on our farm, which I run as a tree farm, is the point I'm trying to make. We have 120 acres uh, and about 110 or so are, are trees. And so we've planted trees there every year since 1966. One year, uh, 7,500. So it's, it's, been, it's been great, great fun uh, watching, uh, watching these trees develop. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a trail going up uh, to the back of my farm at night. It's just kind of interesting. One of the things I have enjoyed so much is hiking around my place. We've had two, three miles of trails all through this, uh, these woods, and it's just so much fun. We've probably got, well, 60, 65 acres of hardwood, and the rest is uh, uh, white pine and red pine and jack pine and and too many scotch pine that have come by themselves. We are in Washera County in the town of Rose, right at the southern edge of the Great Pinery. We have native white pine on our farm. I have about oh, five, six acres of native pine. And, and we are we're at the southern edge of, of that of that great pinery. We've done on our on my farm now three three loggings since 1966. Another one is scheduled uh, for, for this year or, or next year. And let's go to the next slide. It was um, in 1836 that Wisconsin became a territory. And in 1838, this is a map uh, showing what part of Wisconsin territory was settled. And the Fox River uh, which uh, ran from uh, Green Bay uh, to Prairie du Chien, was the dividing line. And the south and east of that, uh, of the Fox River is, is where uh, farming had begun uh, to some extent, but to the northwest was pretty much still uh, Native American country and trees. So let's go to the next one. Uh, the settlers who came into southeastern Wisconsin uh, found the trees, and this may be a, a terrible thing to have to say, but they, they, they found most of the trees a nuisance. They're in the way. But they also found them useful because they built log cabins like this one, and they built log barns. And I have a book on barns in Wisconsin where I talk about these log barns and how these early farmers uh, used the wood that they had on their property, but most of it was in the way. They cut it down and burned all of these hardwoods to make way and to plant the crops that they wanted to crop. At the time, it was mostly, it was mostly wheat. And to the north, 
especially a line from Green Bay across through Wisconsin Rapids and on over toward uh, Eau Claire, La Crosse and North was the land of the white pine. The next slide, please. These white pines were magnificent trees. Oh my gosh. They would be, there'd be 16 to 20 of these uh, trees per acre in some parts of Northern Wisconsin. They would grow 75 feet tall in 50 years. And many of them were, were three feet across, three feet in diameter. That's what we had in the North. And that's what the people in Southeastern Wisconsin who were farmers, they didn't know much about that. That was still, as they would say, it was Indian country. And so now let's move to the next slide. When we began cutting down these big trees, and moving them to the sawmills in the most difficult way that you could imagine. Can you, can you picture standing on these logs in water that's rushing to, to the south or in some instances to the north and, and moving these logs along? I'll say more about log drivers. This was the Pestigo River. The first boom years for, for logging in Wisconsin started in 1850, which was two years after we became a state. In 1848, we became a state. And 1850 to 1856 is when the first loggers came in to Northern Wisconsin, the first logging that was done. And the market for these white pine, and by the way, white pine float, in the water. If you were to cut down an oak tree to sink to the bottom of the river, white pine floated. So that was one of the characteristics that made it possible uh, for these log drives. There was a market for white pine that was developing in the 18 and eight, uh, 1850s and 1860s. As the cities like Chicago and St. Louis and, and so on began developing. And as the pioneers moved into the Middle West and on further west, the demand for lumber was terrific. And thus the market for these white pines was substantial. Next slide, please. This is a map in, believe it or not, of early Green Bay. And one of the very first uh, commercial sawmills was built uh, near De Pere uh, in 1890. Uh, I was an extension agent in Brown County at one time, lived in Green Bay, and the, the history of the, of the uh, logging industry is very real to the Green Bay people, uh, especially today as it, it's, as it has paper mills and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and Daniel Whitney, uh, he built the first commercial sawmill on the Wisconsin River uh, in 1831, and it was near Nakusa. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of an early Wisconsin sawmill. And these were primitive affairs, dangerous affairs, but terribly important affairs. They were, the early ones were, were mostly all, were they, mostly all, they all were water powered because steam power uh, hadn't, hadn't yet come along. And can you believe this? In 1849, the year after Wisconsin became a state, there were 47 sawmills on the Wisconsin River. Why so many? Well, the Wisconsin River was full of rapids, full of stones, full of difficulties for log driving. And so the sawmills were much closer together. The log driving was too difficult. Let's go to the next one. In Menasha, there was a pail and tub factory uh, that came along. And, and there were these side uh, uh, projects uh, in Wisconsin from the very early days. And, and pine wood was used for so many things. And there were barrel staves, broom handles, clothes pins. Some of the things that we take for granted and wonder where in the world they'd come from. Well, they, they'd come from places like this where the factory produced these kind of wood products. Oshkosh especially became a center for wood products, especially shingles. And the early shingles that found their way on, 
on all kinds of buildings, barns and houses and sheds and whatever. And the early days were all wooden and they were white pine, kind of interesting. Go to the next one, please. One of the things that intrigued me in doing the research for this book was the, the concept of the logging camp and how they were developed, how they were founded, who was there, what they did, when, it, when all of this occurred. And I especially was interested in how a logging camp was established. What, took in, what was taken into account? And th this is an interesting picture because you see that old buggy off to the side. And it, it, these fellows, it, I mean, that looks like it's a cold place to be, and it was. All of the logging was done in the winter because of the snow for transportation. I'll talk more about that later. And there weren't any bugs and all that sort of thing. And so the logging was done during the winter months. Well, how did we get this camp established? A timber cruiser. They, the side name for this timber cruiser was a land looker. And this fellow a, a trained in, in determining the value of lumber on a given piece of land would come into an area that had been purchased after the Indian treaties that had been purchased by the logging company for the potential of logging it and the timber cruiser. He came in and determined where, whether or not it was worth what they were paying for, wanted to pay for it. And he determined where there should be a logging camp. A small crew came in first and built these rustic buildings prior to the time that most of the, the lumberjacks arrived at the camp. And the camps had, oh, generally 25, uh, on average 25 uh, lumberjacks per camp. Let's go to the next one, please. This is a, a, a photo of a logging crew in uh, 1886. A sturdy bunch of men, my gosh, even looking at that picture, you get a chill. It's a cold looking picture. The early loggers, early lumberjacks and loggers who came from New England and from Eastern Canada, because our people in Wisconsin, they didn't know about logging, they were farmers. They came here as pioneer farmers. But from Maine and New Hampshire and Eastern Canada came these tough guys who were the early lumberjacks in these logging camps. The Wisconsin farmers who were growing wheat down in the southern part of the state discovered the fact that they could earn a little extra money by going north and being a lumberjack in the wintertime. So we had more and more farmers, as my uncle Fred uh, did, would go north and cut lumber, cut trees in the wintertime. Let's go to the next slide. A lot of the lumberjacks were pretty young in their, in their late teens and 20s. And they earned about, oh, $25, $30 a month. And it was hard, cold, dangerous work. There weren't any fancy uh, pieces of equipment that we have today. They, they were lucky to have a crosscut saw that you see over the back of this young man and an ax. Those were the two things that were most prominent in these logging camps. Let's go to the next one, please. The king of the camp was the cook. The camp cook would earn as much as $100 a month. Because if the men were not happy with what they had to eat, the whole business fell apart. So the cook, and notice that there's a, the assistant cook, they call him a cookie. He's sitting there. He does all of the running around. It's the cook who made the decisions about what was to be served and all the rest of it. Next slide, please. Here we see the men at dinner or supper eating quietly. No words were spoken. Everybody ate and they, they ate pretty well, as I alluded to. If they didn't have good food, then there was great and unhappiness. Next slide, please. Sometimes they were too far away from the camp uh, to come back for the noon meal. So the meal was brought out to them. So here's a group of lumberjacks 
out in the woods having their noon lunch. You can see how splendid that situation was. Next slide, please. Here is an example picture of one of those big trees and a couple of guys that are getting ready or have already started uh, taking it down. The other side of the tree would have been a notch uh, made by an ax. Anybody that knows anything about cutting down trees knows first notch the tree. And then you, you with the crosscut saw, you saw from the other side. And I learned very early from my dad how to do all of this. If you didn't do it right, the, the, the tree would not fall where you wanted it to. And sometimes it, it would fall on one of you. It was a dangerous proposition. And the, the saw had its own particular way. You had your own particular way of doing it. You never pushed on the saw. You always pulled. And you were in partnership with the guy on the other side, of course. But you always pulled. You never pushed. If you pushed, you jammed the thing up. There's nothing worse than a jammed saw in a great big old tree. Let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Once the tree was down, in the early days, it was oxen, later horses, pulled the log to the place where a sleigh, where there was a, a, a road through the woods on its way to the riverbank. One of the characteristics of these logging camps is that they all were relatively near a river because the river was a transportation route for the trees, as I pointed out early, earlier with my mention of the log drivers. So here we're hauling the trees to the, to the place where they would be put, and go to the next slide, please, where they would be lifted onto, and this, I, I don't think they had these many logs on every sleigh. I think this was put together for the photographer, but can you imagine uh, uh, probably four or six horses pulling that load of logs down a trail and there was a machine that would ice sometimes that ice the track but if this load happened to get away and start to run over the ho horses you had a, a terrible problem so the, these are these are going to the riverbank and once they're on the riverbank they are piled there and they wait for spring and the logs rolled into the river and the lumberjacks or the, the log drivers taking them down the way. Next slide, please. The life in a logging camp was really kind of interesting. And you look at these guys and they seem quite content. One of the characteristics, and, and these men were, lumberjacks were proud of this, they never took a bath all winter long. Can you imagine that? Never took a bath all winter long. And you come in to this logging camp, this bunkhouse, and you would, you would smell wet wool. And if you've ever smelled wet wool, and most of people my age have, uh, it's not a pleasant smell. So you smelled a lot of wet wool and you, you smelled, uh, well, if you hadn't taken a bath all winter, you know what kind of a smell that might be. Uh, what were you doing at night? Well, they were mending socks, darning mittens, repairing their clothing. And let's go to the next slide. In some of the camps, there was, there was a musician, a fiddler. And so here we got a fiddler fiddling and a guy trying to dance. I mean, the, the, they created their own fun because generally speaking, these logging camps were some considerable distance from any town. And so people, lumberjacks were pretty much isolated there. Next slide, please. On Sunday, which was a day of rest, is when you could get a shave probably or a haircut. And here's a guy getting a shave by the by the wood stove on, on Sunday morning. Next slide. One of the side issues in these camps was the um, idea of a hodag, which came out of Rhinelander. Gene Shepard was a timber cruiser in, uh, in Rhinelander. 
And he had invented the idea of the hodag. In fact, he'd made one out in the woods and he took people out there to, took some guys out there to see it. And they said, oh my gosh, there it is. And of course it was fake, but that's the stories that were told to the, to the new, the newbies, the lumberjacks who were younger and maybe in the first or second year in the camp. And, and they, were, they were told, look out, Oh my gosh, look out uh, for the hodag because it roams through these woods. Of course, there was no such thing as a hodag. But one of the old time loggers, the lumberjacks have got in the woods and make a, whoa, oh my gosh, these young guys are there. Oh, we're in a, we're, oh, geez, got to be careful to watch out for the hodag. Next slide, please. <coughs> then the, the Paul Bunyan stories were something else. Uh, Paul Bunyan uh, was uh, beyond Wisconsin, of course, Minnesota, Upper Michigan. Uh, he, he, his stories uh, were around for, for years, and, and they were absolutely preposterous. Uh, for example, one of the stories uh, told about Paul Bunyan is, is that he tied a rope to the end of his axe, and he cut down 40 acres of pine with a single swing. Quite an event. And thus, he was responsible for clearing North and South Dakota of trees. That's true. There aren't many trees in North and South Dakota. And it was Paul Bunyan's fault. Well, those are the kind of stories that were told around the stoves and around the campfires at the, and the logging camps. Let's go to the next slide. Now back to the... To the to the log drivers. These were the daredevils. Some of them had been lumberjacks uh, in, the, in, in the winter. And then in spring, they became log drivers. And they rode these logs down the rivers. It was the most dangerous job you could imagine. And very often, on the bends in the river, you would look up on the river bank, and there would be a cross. And that cross would signify that one of the log drivers had died at that point. And that happened more than, more than you'd ever know. Next slide, please. One of the difficulties with the log drivers was the, was, was the log jams. A log would get stuck on a rock or a tree stump or something in the, in the, in the river. And pretty soon all the logs behind it would back up and you would have a mess like you see right here. And, and this was uh, on the, on the uh, uh, St. Croix River, if I remember correctly. Next slide, please. Here's another, my gosh, can you imagine how to untangle a mess like this and get the logs moving again? There were people, I talk about it in my book, whose job it, were, uh, whose job it was to, uh, uh, to untangle these logs. And often they would go in with dynamite and blow up a segment of the log. They're looking, they would look for the key log, the one at the beginning that had caused the problem in the first place. And if they could get the key log removed, then things might start moving again. It, log jams were a, were a terrible, terrible uh, uh, threat uh, to the whole process of moving the logs down the rivers. Next slide, slide please. Behind, following the log, uh, the, the log drivers in these canoes, they're called bateaux, uh, were men whose job it was to find the straggling logs, those are caught in the bank or against a rock or something, and get them back in the river and get them moving. So they wanted to make sure that every log uh, made its way down the river. Next slide, please. And then following along behind everything was what was called a wanagon, a little house on a, on a flat boat. And here is where the cook, uh, in this case, there must have been a woman cook. There's several women in this picture. And this is where the lumberjacks had their personal uh, 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 effects. And most of them would have a tent and a sleeping bag or, or something of that order. And so at night, the log drivers would come ashore set their tent, eat a good big meal prepared in this little hut by a, uh, by a cook, 
so it was it was quite an interesting uh, quite an interesting deal. Um, the log drivers were paid a bit more, maybe twice as much sometimes as as the lumberjack. So there was good money in it, but it also was so very dangerous. The river pilot, the guy in charge of the whole operation, he had a kind of a an office in this building as well, where he tried to keep track of who was who and, and so on. So let's go to the next picture and we will see a river pilot. And he is uh, sort of looking where they're headed and has a lot of stories to tell. By the way, uh, after the uh, sort of along the way, uh, the, some of the logs were put together into rafts and so the rafts went down the river. So it, it, it graduated from single logs to more than that. And then something happened that changed everything. And let's go to the next slide. The railroads arrived in the north. And the railroads changed everything. Uh, the first ones uh, went back as far as 1870s. But it wasn't until about 1910 that the lumber people saw the railroad as the answer because now they no longer needed to float their logs down the river, uh, that they, uh, they could haul them on a time. They didn't, have to have, they didn't have to be near a river. The railroads could go most anywhere that the rails were laid. And so by as, as 1910 and on, the railroads uh, eliminated the need for the log drivers. They also uh, changed, the, changed the structure of where the sawmills could be located because now the railroad could take the logs uh, most any place and, and they did. Let's go to the next one, please. Sawmill towns. One of the interesting things about the history of logging in northern Wisconsin is the effect that they had, I'll talk about on the environment in just a little bit, but the effect they had on the creation of towns and villages throughout the north. Just to mention a few, logging was the influencer for Marinette, Oconto, Park Falls, Peshtigo, Rhinelander, Tomahawk, Phillips, Eau Claire, Mellon, Wausau, Stevens Point, Wisconsin Rapids, La Crosse, Menasha, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Black River Falls, Rice Lake, Woodruff, Sister Bay. That's a, that's a bunch of, of villages and cities. And the population uh, was booming in these towns because Every, almost every one of them had a sawmill or some kind of mill that was connected to the, uh, uh, to, the to the wood industry, to the forestry industry. And so thousands, literally thousands of men, or, and a few women, not very many, most of the women were cooks, uh, were, were thousands of men found work in the, in the logging industry or in the sawmills or in some related industry. It was a booming time until the early 1900s. From as recent, uh, right after the Civil War, on until 1910 or so, we were a premier uh, logging state, no question about it. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. There was a, there was a negative dimension to all of this as well. Most of these logging companies practiced what was called clear cutting, which meant every tree was cut. And the North saw too many acres of land that looked like this, where there was nothing to hold the soil. And so we saw gullies developing as amongst these old, these old tree stumps. And even though there was the positive feature of jobs and the development of cities and towns. The land, the land suffered in the North. And the University of Wisconsin was uh, getting going in those days in agriculture. And the suggestion was that farmers 
should come into this area and farm this land. And that was in, in most instances, was, with some notable exceptions, it was a mistake. Most of, many of these acres, most of these acres of what had been forest land were, were best suited for trees, not for corn. One of the problems when you're trying to grow corn in way northern Wisconsin, that grow, even today, the growing season is way considerably shorter than we have in, in southern Wisconsin. So we had a, a, a real problem for a number of years. And I wrote a book about the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, which operated from 1933 to 1942. And the, conserv the Civilian Conservation Corps, young men, government program, <coughs> which, which helped plant trees. Thousands of these acres were planted to trees. And a lot of these acres were saved because of the, uh, of the replanting, so the work of the CCC. Today, the recreational opportunities of our North are, are fantastic. Second growth trees are most everywhere. Uh, we have, as a secondary industry that was developing after the sawmills and the white pine planks and all of that two by fours, it's the paper industry. And we were, and we still are, uh, number one in the production of, of paper uh, in, in the country. We still are a wood products, a wood products uh, state uh, without question. Uh, so the story of the story of forestry in the north is a story of romantic. With, with romantic dimensions. There are those who look at the log drivers as fantastic. There were men who were bigger than life, who were willing to float down the rivers of Wisconsin and Chippewa and the Wolf and more and risking their lives to chase a pine tree uh, down the river. And you think about it, my gosh. And what happened in the spring when the logging season closed down and the lumberjacks, what did they do? Well, those who were farmers, they went back south and farmed. But those who were not farmers, they went into places like Hurley and they partied. And there were enormous events going on in the celebration of the end, of the end of the logging season for the year. And, and, and it, so it's, it, the story has many dimensions to it. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop now and, and allow people to raise questions with me. And if you want me to talk more about any part of this, I'd be more than happy to do that. You can look me up on jerryapps.com and see what other things I've done. If you have a question you want to send to me, you can send it to my email address, jerryappsauthor at gmail.com. I'd be glad to answer it. And uh, one more slide yet, Chris, I believe. Here's where you, can, where you can find my book, When the White Pine Was King, and learn so much more than I was able to share in these few minutes. Here's the book, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, that I mentioned. The Land Still Lives, the very first book I wrote, and then I, there's a new edition that came 50 years later, I wrote in 1970. And it's a book about um, my, own, my farm. And I, I knew Gaylord Nelson, most of you will know, know him and know about Earth Day and all of that. And Gaylord Nelson wrote the introduction to, to the book, Wisconsin Agricultural History, uh, talks a bit about forestry. Uh, Whispers and Shadows is, a, is, a, is also another book about uh, spending time in the woods and listening, listening carefully for the whispers and looking in the shadows. My dad always said, when you walk in the woods, listen for the whispers, the sounds not often heard, and look in the shadows for that which is not often seen. And he was so right, because there's so much in nature that goes beyond the obvious. 
I'll stop at this point and entertain any questions anyone might have. So uh, this is Tom Giro. I'm a member of the Forest History Association. I'll be curating the questions tonight. I uh, just wanted to show that I have my copy of the book. It's a very nice book and I highly recommend it. It's a very good read and uh, very interesting. A lot of research went into that, into talking to Jerry before the program. I, I learned a little bit about how he went about that and it's really fascinating. So I'm gonna get right to the questions here. If you do have questions, you can use the chat or QA function that you'll find on most computer devices at the bottom. If you have an iPad or sometimes like some things like that, sometimes it's at the top, but you're looking for either chat or Q&A. So we'll get right to these questions. Okay, Steve Schmidt asks, uh, what was the entry level position in the logging camp? And was there a progression uh, for a lumberjack could move through the ranks? That's a, that's a very good question. As far as I could tell, uh, there were, the, the progression was uh, to inexperienced to experienced. Uh, maybe they got a little more pay as they're more experienced. And uh, th so there really wasn't any, any layer levels of, of, of lumberjacks. You were, you were a lumberjack. And they picked on the younger guys, as was often the case with work of that sort. And the, uh, if you wanted to move up in the, um, in, in the rank, so to speak, uh, you, you became a cook. Uh, and the, the cooks were just prized, oh my gosh. Uh, and you, you moved your way up to become a cook by first being a cookie, which means you washed the dishes and you served the meal on the table and, and uh, you did all, you started the fires in the morning. You get up at three o'clock in the morning uh, to start the fires for, the, for breakfast. It was not an easy job, but you could work your way up to becoming the cook. Other, other people, uh, well, I should, I should add another couple of things. In addition to the lumberjack uh, in the lumber, in the, in the logging camp, there were the teamsters, those who drove the horses, that had a higher level position because generally people brought their own horses along from the farms or wherever they lived uh, to be in the lumber camp in the winter. And so, and the, and the people who were doing the hauling of the of the logs to the riverbank, that's another level. Uh, I, I, I back up a little bit and, and add those pieces to different kinds of jobs that you could do at, at a lumber camp. Now there were blacksmiths in the lumber camps who were responsible for shoeing the horses and, and sharpening the, the saws and all that kind of sort, uh, that kind of thing. So there were several different kinds of, of jobs available, but insofar as working your way up from a lumberjack to a to a higher level Loma Jack, I, I was not aware of any any obvious progression. Yeah, you know, I uh, do a little research in this area and there's a census taker that went to Presque Isle, Wisconsin, and normally they would just say laborer, but he listed every job in a lumber camp, barn boss, you know, cookie, cook, a chore boy. He had yeah. uh, every a uh, job listed. It was kind of fascinating. I'll have to share that with you, Jerry, send you a copy that's, of that. That's, that's, that's really kind of interesting. Uh, okay, here's a question for you. Uh, someone wants to know what the yellow sticky notes are on your bookshelf behind you. <laughs> that's remind me what's there. <laughs> my my, my, uh, my, my son-in-law, who's a middle school teacher, he came by one time, he said, Jerry, your library is an absolute disaster. I said, what do you mean? You don't have it organized. You've got nature books mixed up with forestry books mixed up with cows. And he, I said, well, what are you gonna do about it? He said, I'm going to organize it for you. And he's <laughs> spent he's all day organizing it. And I, I so much liked his little yellow stickers where he indicated these are nature books, <laughs> these are environmental books, et cetera. So I, I, I appreciate it because I had to hunt for this when I was looking for it. <laughs> I, um, I, um, one of the things that, that, uh, that I've discovered along the way, and it sounds weird maybe, but my, my office is, a, is an absolute mess. Uh, I mean, I sort of know where everything is, I sort of, but it's, it's, a, it's a mess. And when I, um, I, I taught creative writing for a long time, 30, 40 years, as a matter of fact. 
And I would I'd see people's offices. Anybody, and this sounds weird, but anybody who had a really clean office, everything was all organized. They weren't very creative. They spent <laughs> too much time organizing things. <laughs> Okay, my uh, friend Cindy Stiles asked, uh, what happened to the men who died on the Spring Drive? Were they buried on the banks or taken down to the town in the Wanigan? Uh, so- uh, by, by, and, by and large, as I think I mentioned, they were, they were buried where they, where they uh, were recovered. And generally that would be on the banks of the rivers. And I, I think I mentioned that the, you could see crosses sometimes on the banks of the river and that would indicate that a log driver had died in the river near that place. Uh, they were not transported any place. Nobody tried to get them back home or anything like that. Uh, something that would happen uh, today, that did not happen at that time. Yeah, at the, across the north, you, there are old uh, logging camp cemeteries here and there. Again, in Presque Isle, there's there a are. shanty boy uh, uh, logging camp style uh, cemetery where there were uh, you know, a dozen or so people buried in a really compelling uh -huh. story about who had a boy who had drowned in the mill pond. Oh, really? Uh, a lot of, lot of interesting stories. But they, they, uh, I don't mean to, uh, uh, to, to say it lightly, the logging, it still is, the logging business was very dangerous. And in those days, it was extremely dangerous. And no matter if you were in the woods cutting down trees, or if you're trying to haul logs to the river bank, or if you're riding the logs down the river, all of that was extremely dangerous. And there were no doctors in these, in these logging camps, different from the CCC. The CCC, which was some years later, of course, they generally had a, a doctor in the camp because that, the CCC boys were doing dangerous work too. But in the logging era, there wasn't electricity. and uh, it, it was just, it was a tough time. Yeah. But, however, however it, it, it was a tough time in the logging camp, but that's the way it was at home. See, I, I grew up with, without electricity and wood stoves and all that kind of stuff. So if you went to the logging camp, it's, it's the same what you had at home, except it's more dangerous. Yeah, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, water diseases like typhoid, you know, because they you know didn't have water treatment or safe water systems and uh, lots of issues like that. So it was one, uh, one of the, my uncle Fred would, would tell this story often. Uh, he would, he would say, uh, the first, the first warm day in spring, he said, we would all at the lumber camp, we would all take off, uh, we would all take off our long underwear and we would lay it on the river bank. And when, when the bed bugs would go for a drink, what, we would grab up our lumber, our long underwear, and put it back on again. Bed bugs were a heck of a problem. That's true. It, it, it was not a pleasant place to sleep in those bunk houses. Well, of course, they were, most of them, they had straw mattresses. So you didn't exactly. have yep. regular, regular mattresses. Uh, so here's a question about uh, someone who's wondering about uh, logging camps in Langley County in the 1880s and 1890s, and wondering how to uh, find information about those uh, types of camps. What's, what's your recommendation? One of the things that I would recommend is to, uh, is to go to one of the logging museums. Uh, there's a really good one in Rhinelander. Uh, um, and at that logging museum, they have records of of uh, a number of the logging camps. They also have a lot of CCC records at, at that uh, particular museum. But I, I did not attempt, and I don't see, I, it would have been a trick to do it. Uh, I did not attempt to identify the names of people in the various logging camps. That, that would have been, I probably could have done some of that with census work, but it, it would have taken a lot longer than it did. Correct. Uh, if you uh, go back and look at the YouTube channel for the Forest History Association, I did a little program on logging camps in Waters Meet and Presque Isle and Marinesco, Michigan. So, uh, like and, a good place. and uh, you know, it's you got to do your legwork and find, dig into the local histories and find that information. It's not always that in, in easy to do. Exactly. Um, so, uh, Sam was wondering uh, if there were 
uh, cases of people of color working in the uh, uh, lumberjacks in Upper Michigan or other places in Wisconsin there, in the 1800s. There were there, there were uh, there were some Native Americans working in the lumber camps. I know of no um, uh, African American people. I have no record of that. There were a few African American boys working in the CCC camps, but the um, in the logging camps. As I mentioned, the early the early lumberjacks that all come from New England, uh, because that that's something that they had learned how to do there. But the idea of people of color in the logging camps beyond some Native Americans, uh, there were, as far as I could find out, and I, 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 there certainly are exceptions, I'm sure, to what I found out, but I didn't find any. So uh, uh, Cheryl is wondering about in Canada, they had uh, temporary railroads. And I think there was a fair amount of that across the north, particularly the narrow gauges, uh, sure. like they had in Three Lakes and other places. Absolutely. Uh, so, some of the lumber companies owned railroads and they would lay the tracks. And, and when they were finished uh, logging that particular area, they'd tear up the tracks and move it to another place. That, that, that was not uncommon. And well, all of, all of that's kind of interesting. Uh, so we have uh, someone on from Durham, North Carolina. Isn't that interesting? So what was the last river drive in Wisconsin? I wish I knew. I don't know that. That's a, that's a very good question. If, if somebody will probably say it was last year because some character would try to do it, but uh, I, I, I don't know when it was. By that, by by nine. Remember, as I said, by 1910, the railroads had come in, and there weren't any more river drives. So it'd be somewhere around there. Uh, so Thomas Aldrich asks, "Have you ever visited uh, Nama, Michigan?" And if you go back again to our archive on the YouTube channel, I have uh, from my program. Uh, about the Boniface Lumber Enterprise in the UP, some information about Nama, Michigan. Uh, again, a large uh, mill there, very interesting place, and there's some really nice photos in that presentation. So I have to switch over to the chat here and get to some more questions. You're a popular guy, Jerry. All right. Lots of compliments about your program. Lots of people commenting about family members who had worked in uh, various uh, uh, parts of logging camps, cooks, that kind of things. Again, another question about the last uh, log drive. And we're going to have to do some work on that, Jerry, I think, uh, just yeah, to see what we to, can dig up. Your people working on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be fascinating to, to ferret out. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know your timeline is about accurate. You know, the pine kind of petered out uh, in the late 1890s, 1900, and then that's when the railroads came in and they started doing more of the hardwood and some of the other uh, logging operations because they were able to uh, get the logs out with the railroad. For the, ma the maple and the, and the oaks uh, that would not float in the rivers, uh, the railroad made a difference, so they, that's right. That was should have mentioned that. That was a very interesting uh, thing that happened. All of a sudden, now the logging industry expanded beyond just the white pines, of which I focused on the book. But the the maples, especially hard maple and and uh, and and the oak trees, now they could be harvested. Um, my my own farm. I come back to that. Uh, I, I do both kinds of logging. We, we, we log the pine and we also log the hardwood. So it is, it is a different process. Yeah, a couple more questions about, you know, how to research things locally in different areas, one from Barron County. And again, I'd really recommend uh, that people uh, connect with their local history societies. And, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's one of the first places I start for with, with most of the research that I do. Is to uh, is to go to the local historical society. They're they're of tr tremendous help. I've I've just finished writing a book on the history of county and state fairs, and I in, in, in this book I went right to the local. I, I went to the county extension offices because they were involved with fairs, and I went to local historical societies. Always a good place to go, and they're fun people to peer around. Oh my gosh. 
And very old, old friend of mine here, Dan Bauman, asks the question, can you talk a little more about how the land was accessed? Did the lumber company buy the land and resell it after logging? Or did yeah, the loggers have contracts with private landowners? That's a very, very interesting story. Uh, because when the, uh, when the Indian treaties uh, were in, in 18, what, 30 something, and some of the treaties in the North were done, the, the one of the later ones was 1848, the Menominees, but that's a whole different story. Uh, the, once those treaties were signed, then the land became federal land and it, it was sold. The, the common figure was a dollar and a quarter an acre, uh, but some of it I know was less than that. So the logging companies tended to buy the land and then when they logged it, they sold it. And but sometimes they just walked away. And it, you know, it, I try to discuss some of that in the book and it's very complicated because once it was logged, then as far as the logging company was concerned, it was worthless. It, what did we just get away? Uh, like Mr. Weyerhauser, he just took his whole business to the, to the Northwest. Uh, and that happened a lot. So these farmers that came into the area, uh, some of them bought this land from the logging companies, I don't know, prices like two bucks, three bucks, five bucks an acre, something like that. During the depression, uh, 1929 on to 1940, 41, uh, ten, they lost their farms. They couldn't, they couldn't pay the taxes, the income was down. And some of them just walked away. And that a lot of that land became uh, uh, county forests, state forests, and national forests in Wisconsin. A lot of, uh, a lot of tax uh, uh, deficient land uh, uh, became, own, was own, became part of the government again, became parks and, and national and state forests. Uh, so a question about, again, uh, can you recommend a book on Lake Superior region logging history? I, there's probably one, but I don't know about it. Uh, I would recommend you visit the Great Lakes Visitor Center there in That's Ashland. Right. And uh, they have a history center located right in the visitor center. And I bet you they'd be able to connect you. And again, we've had a couple of programs. If you go back to the, our, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we had one on uh, the log drives that went across Lake Superior and how they lifted the logs out or the, this, this was pulp wood log lifting and they lifted it out of the lake and put it on trains to be sent down to the mills in Wisconsin yeah. Rapids. Yep. All kinds of interesting stories like that. Uh, Uh, the other thing on the, the land purchasing, you know, my relatives in the UP bought the land at about 60 cents of acres. I've reached, researched the purchase. And the first, the, the federal forest came in, the uh, uh, Hiawatha Forest, and, the, uh, and they tried to buy land from the lumber, lumber barons. And uh, he fought the first couple of uh, condemnations that they did. And then he figured out he could sell it for twice what he bought it for. And he started selling land wholesale to the federal forest system. Uh, well, I tell you, that was an interesting time. And the, uh, the, the well, the zoning laws, I, could, I have a section in the book about that, that developed at the time that, that said uh, in a given area, thou shalt not farm, build a house, put a road that, and, Oneida County, I think, is one of the first ones to, to develop these zoning laws. There's several other developed as well. Can you talk a little bit about the immigrants that came to work in the logging camps? Yeah, they, uh, the, the Swedes and the Norwegians especially uh, were often, uh, often found themselves in the logging camps. And in, in fact, all, almost all Wisconsin is a hotbed of, of immigrants. Most people, it, it, I wrote about this in a different book. By 1900, we had some 30, 40 different ethnic groups here. And so it would be, it would just make sense that many of them would, they, most of them came here as, as farmers, but many of them found their way into the logging camps. So the logging camps uh, generally were, were 
were pretty much mixed up with, with and, and reflected what was the case in the rest of Wisconsin in terms of different ethnic groups. But again, the Norwegians, first off, number one ethnic group in Wisconsin was still is, if you look at it, German. And number two was Norwegian. And, and number three at the turn of the century, uh, but Polish. And, and then so on. They had a whole everything else that you could imagine. So they were involved in logging, no question about it. Yeah, the uh, census I'm going to share with you um, also listed um, unusually their, their country of origin, but mm -hmm. even more so, they would list the German state they came from, which is kind of unusual to have that kind of detail. Well, and there were so many Germans, they <laughs> sort them out. But, yeah. yeah, a question about the burners uh, at the sawmills. Uh, are you familiar with those? About the which what? The burners. So the, uh, the it looked like an old silo, and they burn the sawdust, generate steam, yes. to power the mill with steam. That's the way uh, I understood it. There, uh, sawdust. The, the the sawdust story is kind of interesting. Uh, so many like Oshkosh, I think at one time they, they paved their roads with sawdust. Uh, it, it, saw, sawdust, nobody seemed to know what to do with it. They dumped it in the rivers, they dumped it in the lakes, and they burned it. Um, so uh, again, uh, from our friend at the uh, uh, school forest program, Steve Schmidt, uh, many of the early a comment about many of the early school forests were tax delinquent lands that were turned over to schools. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, we uh, I, I was a student at uh, Wild Rose High School when we got the first school forest and was a, a part party to planting the very first trees in, in that school forest. That year would have been oh, 1949, 1950. Day or two ago. Uh, can you uh, talk about the land grant colleges and the relationship uh, uh, to the uh, settlement of the state and the lands? Sure. Uh, 1862, uh, in the midst of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln signed the land grant uh, law, uh, which um, gave to the states blocks of land uh, that could be sold for the purpose of creating a College of Agriculture, where I spent 30 years teaching. And the College of Agriculture uh, in, in those early days uh, was trying to get itself established. And it had on its agenda, and I was an extension agent at one time as well, it, it had an extension program devoted to clearing land in the North for farming. And there were men, specialists from Ag Engineering Department, that went by train to the north with, of all things, dynamite to show how to blow stumps. And that had to be one of the most exciting things in the world. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to follow the history of people blowing stumps, you found a history of arms missing, hands missing. <laughs> <laughs> and people killed. Dynamite was a dangerous deal. And here's, here's what happened. I got a whole story in the book about this. The, uh, you, 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 here's this great big old stump, and you need to get rid of it. You put a stick of dynamite under it, and you light it, and you run like the dickens away, and nothing happened. Well, for heaven's sakes, I got to go see what happened. You walk up to it, and it goes kaboom. And the stump and you together go flying in the air. And the stump has cleared the land, but it's also cleared the ownership of it. A little bit of a morbid story there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this has been really good. I think, uh, unless Don has a question that I missed somewhere, I think we're uh, pretty much covered most of the questions. It was such a pleasure to have you tonight. You're oh, I enjoy doing this no end. It's it's great fun. Yeah, you're a great yeah. storyteller, great writer, and I'll 
be a fan forever, I think. So appreciate your time tonight. Yep, thank you so very much. And thanks to everyone who, who tuned in. All right, everybody. Um, we don't know what we have on the schedule for next month, but you'll see a message from us uh, and we'll uh, certainly be uh, uh, advertising it. Uh, so if you've registered for this, you'll get a notice. Uh, Don does a good job of keeping track of you and, and letting you know what's up next on the schedule. So appreciate everybody and everybody have a good night. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>